All right, look at verse 14 of Philippians chapter 3. It says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal <clears throat> even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, for ye have us for an ensample, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. I want to point out a couple of things to you. First off, in this passage, when he talks about the enemies of the cross of Christ, the enemies of the cross are those who try to add works to salvation. People, anybody, anybody who comes along and teaches that you can somehow gain righteousness through anything other than the work of Jesus Christ, they are the enemies of the cross. But understand, the motivation behind these people uh, teaching these things, all right, these people who mind earthly things, notice how it says their God is their belly. There are people out there that creep into churches, the Bible says, that they have a desire to take advantage of people. They want, you know, the, sometimes they want the money. Many times they want the power. They want, in, in many cases, the women in the church. And we have seen, and in history, there, is a, there are many examples we could talk about of abuse that has taken place in church. And unfortunately, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement has not been immune to this. And I just want to say, what I'm preaching about tonight, I have had planned to preach for the last month, all right? Nothing in you know, recent days has motivated this message, all right? I'm going to prove it to you. How many, or first off, how many saw the article? It was the Star Telegram, I believe, that put it out. It was going all over the place. Uh, but it said, it said the Star Telegram discovered at least 412 allegations of sexual misconduct in 187 independent fundamental Baptist churches and their affiliated institutions spanning 40 states in Canada. All right, that was it was going all over the place, and there it was you know some pretty nasty stuff in there. And I had somebody email me back on December 10th. All right, and since then I have planned on preaching on this, but because of the holidays and things I already had planned preaching. I had to put it off until now, so I, I'm, I want to try to stick on subject. But this is the email that they sent me. It said, Hi, Pastor Tommy. I just happened to have stumbled on, onto this article about IFBs. Please, please tell me that it isn't true. I am relatively new to IFB and was not aware of this kind of stuff going on. How could this have happened? And is there danger of it happening again, happening again in the new IFB? That was the question that was asked on December 10th. And, I, and then I responded and I said, I'm sad to say that I know that much of this article is true. I do not believe it is likely to happen in the new IFB because much of what caused the situations that you read in that article were all the things that we in the new IFB often bash the old IFB for. Their flawed system is what created these problems. The new IFB in many ways is a response to these type of flaws that many of us saw when we were in the old IFB. It could definitely happen if we are not careful and get too big for our britches. I hope and pray it never happens, and it won't if we stick to our guns. All right. So that was the, that was the email that took place that uh, motivated all this. But you'll notice I made the statement in there how you know their flawed system is what kind of created a lot of this. And I read a lot of the examples and the stories that they gave in there. And unfortunately, some of these things are true. I knew many names of people that were mentioning these things. I was familiar with the circumstances. And I saw that. And I was like, you know, I want to preach a message on this because much of what we do in this church, much of how things are run, much of what we believe, what we teach, a lot of the things that we don't do, I believe are in response to things the previous generation did wrong. There's, unfortunately, as much as I love the IFB, they, weren't, they have not been perfect. Okay? The last generation dropped the ball on some things. They, they messed up on some things. It doesn't mean they were bad people. It just means they messed up. And you know what? When somebody messes up, you ought to learn from that. 
and you ought to correct it, okay? And unfortunately, we've got a whole bunch of preachers today that are from the 70s that are just going, we've got to stick to the old paths, we've got to stick to the old paths. You know, let's keep doing what we were doing. But wait a minute, some of the things that we were doing has caused a lot of problems and were wrong and even unbiblical. Why can't we fix these things? Why can't we say, we're not going to do these things, we're not going to have this in our church, why can't we do that? I personally think that we ought to do that because I don't want this type of thing happening. And of course, in, these, you know, in this article, there's a lot of stuff that happened. And a lot of these things that I'm going to mention in no way are why every one of these things happened. Okay? There's been a lot of scandals, there's a lot of examples, and there's a lot of reasons. However, I do think there are some key things that, you know, are, have taken place that have been big in the IFB that has kind of created a you know a place where that you know, abuse can thrive. Okay, so for example, all right, you know, if I was to ask you why is there so much abuse in the Catholic Church, what would we say? One of the things we would say was well, because they don't let their priests get married. I mean, that's asking for trouble right there. It's not natural. It's not good for a man to be alone, and we're go they're going and they're telling their priests, the leaders in their church, you know, be celibate. And these are normal, red-blooded men, and I believe a lot of that ends up just creating a situation where perversion is going to run rampant. We would all say that a big reason there's so much perversion in the Catholic Church is because of a flawed system. Would we not agree with that? Well, if there's perversion that's been going on in the IFB, why can't it be that there's maybe a problem with the system many times? And I do. I think there have been things that have, have come into the IFB that are really big that has caused a lot of this stuff. And I think we need to keep these things out of our church. I think we need to learn from these mistakes and we ought to do something about it. And so here's just a few examples. I'm in no way going to cover everything, but I think these are some big things that, I, that I've seen. These are things that I have tried to keep out of our church since we have started this church because I don't, want this I don't want this type of thing happening in our church. I don't want our church getting in the newspaper. I don't want stories about our church being all over the internet, about abuse and things that happen. I don't want to be the one doing any of this stuff. I don't want to wreck my marriage. I don't want to wreck my testimony and this church's reputation. I don't want to devastate the people in my church. I don't want to do that. But guess what? I am a sinful man like anyone else. So the thing is, we are supposed to put away things from us. We're supposed to get rid of occasions to the flesh. We're supposed to flee youthful lust. And I'm afraid many times people, the way they have set things up, they are creating an environment that's just begging for abuse to take place. And so what are some of the things that I think caused a lot of the abuse that we've seen in the IFB? Well, first off, I think one of the things that they did wrong is Baptist pastors, they have seen themselves and they've kind of made themselves like kings and priests in the Old Testament. All right. One thing you hear all the time in the IFB is them referring, you know, uh, when it comes to their authority and how they do things in the church, they often refer to, you know, examples like David. They'll go back to the priests in the Old Testament. They will show the authority that they had and the power that they had, and they compare it to what they do. Now, listen, we can get some biblical principles, you know, from leadership and examples that we see in the Old Testament. However, there is a huge difference between a pastor and a king or a pastor. There's a huge difference between a pastor and a priest. All right. And I got news for these guys. All right. Look at Revelation chapter one, verse four. All right. I got I got some bad news for these guys that have put themselves up on this pedestal higher than they should be. OK, we are not kings. We are not priests as pastors. But look at what it says in Revelation chapter one. Verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Y'all see that right there? Now, how did we become kings and priests? 
Did we come kings and priests as pastors when somebody laid hands on us and ordained us? Or did we come kings and priests when we were washed in his blood? Well, hey, if you're saved today and you've been washed in the blood, guess what? God made you a king and a priest. You know what one of the Baptist distinctives is? The priesthood of the believer. The priesthood of the believer. You know what we teach? You know what Baptists have always taught? That we don't need a priest to get to God. Baptists forever have taught that we have direct access to God as believers, that we have a high priest, and it's Jesus Christ. That's what we've taught. So now why would a pastor go around and, you know, thump his chest and claim authority and base it off a priest in the Old Testament? Why would he do that? Why would I, you know, it would be wrong for me to take examples of what the priest did in the Old Testament and me try to do it with you in the New Testament and say, because I'm your pastor and look at what the priest did in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, priests carried more, they had more power than I do. We see one example of a priest, uh, Phineas, I believe it was, that, you know, he executed some people. Remember he put the spear through the two people committing adultery? All right, I'm not allowed to do that. I've wanted to a few times, but I, I'm not allowed, I, I don't have that authority to do that. I, I'm not a king. I do not have the authority to execute people. You show me anywhere in the Bible where you see a pastor executing somebody. Okay, we can put them out of the church, but I, don't, I do not have that authority. And you listen to these preachers get up there. And folks, I've gone to camp meetings and I've gone to conferences all my life. I know what I'm talking about. I am not exaggerating when I tell you that pastors see themselves as kings and priests. It, like in the Old Testament, that is how they see themselves. They elevate themselves. They'll say, how dare you touch the Lord's anointed? Now, what are they saying when they say, don't you dare touch the Lord's anointed? They're using the example of David versus King Saul. All right? I'm sorry, that was King Saul. Okay? He was ordained, uh, anointed a king. Okay? You were not anointed a king. If you're not allowed to touch the, you know, me as the Lord's anointed, meaning I have the authority of a king, when the Bible says we're all kings and priests, then I, it means I can't touch you either because you're the Lord's anointed. Yeah, but yet they have done this and pastors, I, I mean, I have listened to pastors get up and they throw out these threats. You know, some of you people out there, you know, you go home and listen, you shouldn't go home on Sunday afternoon and eat roast preacher. Okay? You shouldn't do that. Don't go home on Sunday and eat roast preacher and tell her, you know, be talking in front of your kids about everything I did that was wrong and how bad my message was. That's not a good idea, all right? But you know what? I'm not going to get up here and tell you, you know, you go home and you eat roast preacher Sunday afternoon. You know, don't be surprised you don't make it back to church Sunday night because God kills you in a car wreck. You don't put your hand against the Lord's anointed. You know, God sees that, you know, he, he's going to kill you so fast. You know, I listen to these guys do that kind of thing. And it's just like, you know, get over yourself. All right. Uh, you know, you're, you're just a pastor. You're just a shepherd. And we ought to respect that. All right. I, I respect that officer. I take it serious. But you know what? You're not, a, you're not a king any more than anyone else who has been washed in the blood of Christ is a king and a priest. So stop going and using those examples like that. You don't have the ex uh, uh, authority to execute anybody and kill anybody. You don't have the uh, authority to create laws and to create extra taxes and burdens. And, you know, I, I don't have the right to just go and up the tithe to 20%. All right. And just, I don't have the authority to do these things, but it's like preachers in, in the, back in the day, they thought they did. And some of them haven't figured out they still don't have that authority. You know, now that their congregations have figured out, hey, they can't make us stay in this church. And everybody's leaving these places. They still haven't figured out. And, and I could give some examples of just some nut jobs that are out there. Some nut jobs, authority crazed preachers that are literally trying. I mean, they're, they're like the prophets of Baal jumping around the altars on Sunday nights, trying to call down fire on their enemies and all their church members that left. And it's not working. But I, and I. I you know, I can mock these people. Elijah did it. You know, so I, if Elijah can mock them, I can mock them too. It's crazy how they see themselves. But like, so you know, we can we can use leadership examples. You know, in the Old Testament, you can use illustrations and things. But there is a difference. Okay, we are shepherds. We are not lords. It says in First Peter chapter five verse one, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. 
Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Sounds like I'm going to get my glory when Jesus Christ returns. If I do a good job, if I feed the flock, if I set a good example, you know, set a good example. I'm supposed to set an example. I'm supposed to try to inspire you all to follow me and to you know do as I would do, especially when it comes to your home. Because here's the thing too. The God did give the pastor authority in the church, okay? In the church, there is certain authority that I have, but understand that authority does not extend into your homes. Y'all understand that? Now, there are certain sins that the Bible specifically mentions that if you do, it will get you cast out of the church, Okay. You know, if you're a drunker or a railer or extortioner, there's all these things that if you do these things, the Bible says you should be cast out of the church. Okay, the Bible teaches that. I don't get to add things. Okay, if, you, if you're doing something that I don't like, something that I wouldn't do, I don't get to just add that as a new thing and say, you know what, I'm casting you out of the church for it. I don't have the right to do that. I don't have the right to go into your home and if, you're, if there's a dispute between you and your wife, and you, know, you tell your wife, you know what, don't listen to your husband, you listen to me. I don't have the right to do that. My authority does not, it, it, it does not extend there. And you know what? You can't get a lot of pastors to figure that out. And, and there are pastors that are doing that, trying to establish authority in the homes. And I'll show you examples of how they do that here in a little bit. But turn over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. I want you to notice this too. Because if you ever heard the saying, you know, you give somebody an inch, they think, or, uh, they think they're a ruler. Yeah. Give an inch, they think they're a ruler. All right? And we like that word you know, ruler, right? The ruler. Sounds good, right? You know, and people, they see that word rule, and it just goes to their head. Okay? And let's look at an example where they, people see that word rule, and it just goes to their head. But it says in verse 17 of uh, 1 Timothy 5, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one another, uh, one before another, do not, doing nothing by partiality, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, Keep thyselves pure. So we see there, notice it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Y'all see that? There's a condition there. You've got a lot of guys out there, they think because I'm a pastor, therefore I just, I mean, I automatically just get all this double honor. But wait, no, it says those that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And notice this too, because then you have pastors who are not ruling well, we have examples in many of these stories that you read about the abuse that's in these IFB churches, in many cases, the church knew about stuff that this pastor did. They knew this pastor had done something bad sexually. They knew he committed adultery. They often, they even knew he molested somebody, but everybody in the church had this attitude. Well, against an elder received not an accusation. Wait, but it says, but before two or three witnesses. Hey, there's a way to do this. There is a proper way to do it. When we are rebuking somebody in authority, we need to be careful. We need to take it serious. But there is a way to do it. They are not immune. You know, we can't throw them out of the church. I don't want to put, put my hand against the Lord's anointed. For, okay. Let's, God said to do this because notice what it says there too. Against and I'll receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. Okay. That means we can if it's before two or three witnesses. And then it says, them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. So if they have sinned, if that elder has done wrong, if they did violate God's command, if they did do something that disqualified themselves, then you know what that means? We're supposed to rebuke them before all. We're not supposed to sit there and say, I'm sorry, he's the Lord's anointed. He's God's man. I'll let God deal with them. No, God actually told us how to deal with them. And in many cases in churches, they weren't being dealt with. 
They weren't being dealt with because they had been taught that this man was a king and a priest and the Lord's anointed, the man of God like Elisha. He can call she-bears on you and kill all your kids if you say anything about him. And so therefore, we got to just leave this guy alone and let him get away with it when he clearly went against what the Bible said to do. He's in many cases even broken the law and nobody wants to say anything. Folks, there, that, that can't happen. That needs to be done. If I'm out there breaking the law, if I'm out there being immoral, I should be removed. And you know who's supposed to remove me? You all are supposed to do that. You all are supposed to help keep me accountable. And once again, you know, take, the, you know, take an accusation serious. If somebody gets mad and somebody gets bent out of shape in the church and they just want, are out there throwing out accusations, you, know, you don't just go with every accusation. There is a way to do these things. And I preach messages, I'm not going to do it again, about making and receiving accusations. There is a proper way to deal with those things. And as a church, we ought, we ought to deal with those things. And when it comes to and I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I do want to mention this because I don't, I don't want to get in a lot of the examples of things that have happened, all right? But I will mention one that's been in the news uh, recently, the whole Cameron Giovanelli thing, all right, that happened out at uh, North Valley Baptist Church. You know, I have been openly critical of that, and I will tell you why, all right? That man, what he did as a pastor of a church out east, forgot where it is, when that church where these sins took place found out about it, that church got together. The, the new pastor, the leadership in that church, they got together, they investigated the situation, they looked into it, and they determined that this man, in fact, was guilty of what he had done. And they called him out. They called that church where he was serving and they let him know, hey, this man is a wicked man. They told him what he did, and then they tried, they wanted to sweep it under the rug in that church. And then Pastor Shiflet, you know, he had uh, threatened to go public, and thankfully he did go public about what he had done. You know, and then they just kind of slapped the guys in the wrist, and they relocated him to one of the trash can churches where all the perverts go, you know, down in Jacksonville. And people were saying, you know, how dare they do that? You know, we should let the authorities deal with this. Which, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but the Bible makes it very clear that we ought to be able to judge things in the church. The Bible makes it clear we would be better off taking the least esteemed person in the church and letting them judge than going to the unrighteous for judgment. But that's what the old IFB wants to do. Well, we'll let the authorities figure out if he's guilty or not. But there's a problem. A lot of times there's statute of limitations. They can't do anything. You know, they're, they're, a lot of times their hands are tied by certain, you know, laws when it comes to what they're able to do. Hey, as a church, we're allowed to govern ourselves. We can look into these things however we want. And, I've, and the reason I have, you know, publicly supported, you know, throwing that guy under the bus is because of the fact his church said that he was guilty. And so, you know what? I stand with the decision of that church because that church is the proper authority to make that decision. Now, in this article, the Daily Telegram, they talked a lot about Jack Hiles in this, in this article. And whenever you talk about abuse in the IFB, everybody wants to talk about Jack Hiles and the, all of his adultery and all these scandals and things he did. But here's the problem with that. All right? I wasn't there when Cameron Giovanelli did his thing. Okay? I wasn't there. But the church who looked into it, who had the authority to look into it, they determined it was true. I stand with, I, I stand with that church. In the case of all the accusations that came towards Jack Hiles, who was the pastor of the largest Baptist church in the world at that time, who was the most influential preacher, you know, Baptist pastor in the world at that time, who was doing more for God than anybody else in that time, why in the world would I not think people would throw accusations at him? Okay? And at the end of the day, his church agreed that he did not do these things. Now, were they right or wrong? I don't know. I wasn't there. But here's the thing. The proper authorities, the ones who were supposed to deal with it, decided that he didn't. So you know what? I'm going to go along with that. And I'm, I'm getting tired of preachers who have no idea, who weren't there, always wanting to hold him accountable for adultery when they have no idea. They have no idea when the proper authorities determined that he didn't do it, okay? So I'm being fair in these things. If a church decides their pastor did it, 
I'm going to support the decision of that church. If they decide that he didn't do it, I mean, unless it is extremely obvious, I mean, I'm talking like video evidence that he didn't do it, you know, then I'm going to have to say that person's not guilty. I believe because the, the proper authorities, are, I think, are the church in those situations. And so, you know, the truth is God expects us to deal with things. And you got a lot of churches today they're just, they would rather not deal with things. They would rather sweep things under the rug. They would rather just do a cover-up. And folks, cover-ups are wicked. Okay? You can, we should not hide these things. The pastors who go and they abuse their position of authority and betray the trust of people, they need to be publicly called out. Folks, if I go and I take advantage of somebody in this church, if I were to take advantage of some little kid, you ought to go to the police on something like that. If I go and I, if I'm being immoral with another woman, maybe something that's not technically illegal, but something that is wicked just the same, I, I you guys have, have no right to just fire me and then quietly sweep it under the rug. Other people need to know. Otherwise, I can just go out and I can go get a job at a Ruckmanite church somewhere. You know, I shouldn't get a job. I, I, I guess they would they'd hire me even if you knew I committed adultery. But you know, but a, a good IFB church, they might hire me. They might want me because you are being quiet about that. And when you read a lot of these stories about abuse that has taken place in churches, when they start investigating, they find out that this church the pastor abused somebody at, he had done it in the previous church too, and everybody knew about it. And it's like, why weren't they called out? You know why? Because people didn't have the stomach for it. And there's, there's reason for, reasons for that. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But listen, just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean I have no accountability. I am accountable to you all as a congregation. And if I get out of line, you all are the ones that are supposed to deal with it. Okay? You all should throw me under the bus and you ought to make sure you know, that I am rebuked before all. I, am, I, I need to be publicly rebuked for what I have done. And that is, that's your job to do that. And you need to make sure that gets done. All right. And, you know, make me think you're going to do that, folks, just in case I'm ever tempted. I, if I'm ever tempted, I need, I, I need to know that there's going to be an angry mob with pitchforks that are going to, you know, obviously you can't hang me or burn me at the stake or anything like that. But I need to know y'all are going to expose me to the world. All right. I, I need that, so I'm never tempted to even do any of these things. But so many pastors, they've granted themselves man of God status, like Elijah and Elisha. They think they can send two she-bears. I listened to Phil Kidd tell a story one time about a guy that cursed him or something, and he you know, told him he blasphemed the Holy Spirit and he was going to be dead within 24 hours or something like that. You know, he, he tells a bunch of crazy stories like that. And it's like, shut up, all right? Listen, you, you, first off, that never happened. You just made it up. You know, second of all, you know, even if the guy did do that, you know what? Big deal, all right? If God forgives blasphemy against him and the Son forgives blasphemy against him, I know the Holy Ghost, that's not forgiven. But you know what? If blasphemy against the Father and the Son can be forgiven, I'm pretty sure blasphemy against me can be forgiven. Because I'm not even close to the Father and the Son. But Phil Kidd, you know, you, you, know, you curse him, uh, you're, you're going to be dead within 24 hours. That's just stupid, all right? You know, people got to start calling out these preachers in these camp meetings, too, that are just telling these war stories that are just made up, all right? I am, I am so sick of that. These guys, they're not in the Bible enough to actually get anything from the Word of God that will actually you know, help people and people can learn from. So they got to get up and they got to make up stories about themselves. It's ridiculous. And I know they do it because I've listened to these guys tell the stories multiple times and the story gets better every time. And I, I've had enough of it. But, you know, we can't, we can't let these things go to our head. And so... You know, and if I can make some excuses too for the previous generation, all right, I, I, and I mean this, I believe many of these men in the previous generation that kind of set up a flawed system, I believe they were 100% sincere. I even believe a lot of them who kind of who participated in cover ups thought they were doing the right thing because it is, it is tragic. When a pastor falls into sin, all right, when a pastor does some horrible thing, when a scandal breaks, it is a tragic thing. It damages churches, okay? 
It can damage movements. It hurts the cause of Christ. All right? I get that. And I'm afraid many of these people, they thought, though, we need to keep this quiet because we don't want to hurt the cause of Christ. I think, I think that's what a lot of them thought. But the truth is, they violated clear command in Scripture. We never help the cause of Christ when we violate Scripture. You never help the cause of Christ with that. And I, I, I just think they were wrong. I think many of these people, too, the, this praise that they took, this king and priest status that they took upon themselves, that they accepted, I think many of these people thought, hey, this is good. The more people respect me, the more they lift me up, the more power I will have over them, and the more it will, or the easier it will be for me to get them to do good. Because here's the thing, too, when it comes to when it comes to pastors, you know, they often have a lot of wisdom. Okay, they've been around for a long time. You have some old gray-headed pastor that's been pastoring for fifty years. That man's going to have some wisdom. He's going to know what he's doing. If he's a man who ruled his house well and he raised good kids and his kids went on and lived for the Lord, he probably knows what he's doing. If he's somebody that's been in the Scriptures his whole life and he's read through the Bible 50 times, he's going to know a few things. And guess what? I might know a few things as a pastor. I, I've been around. I, I, I've got some experience under my belt. I know the Scriptures. I might have better ideas and I might be more right on what I think you should do all right all right you know brother jerry i might have a you know if he's facing a situation in his life i might have a better wisdom and a better idea of what he ought to do to fix this situation i might know what he should do when it comes to his marriage and his kids and what i think versus what he thinks i might be more right than he is however who did god ordain to take care of his wife and kids God ordained him. God did not ordain me to do that. Okay, I can help, I can preach, I can set an example, but at the end of the day, I have no right to go and try to bully him into doing certain things and to try to force him into doing certain things. I am not the man that God has called to do that. God called for him to do that. God told, called for him to take care of his wife and for him to raise his kids. All right? I might know more about raising kids than some of the other dads around here, but that doesn't give me a right to go and spank your kid. I, have not, I do not have the authority to do that. It is not God's will. And many of these pastors... Because, oh, I've seen people go down this road so many times in my life. And all the times I see them go down this road, it always leads to heartache. It always leads to disaster. If these people would just listen to me, well, I hope they do listen to you. But if they don't, that, that stinks. You can't make them. You can't force them. You're not allowed to do that. And then a lot of these guys, in the desire to try to get people to do right, they have set up structures that I think would you know, help them have control. They have the Christian schools that people are paying money to send their kids to that they can say, you know what, if you let your daughter wear this, you know, in your home, outside school hours, you're getting kicked out of the school. Okay? And the truth is, it's like, well, if you're going to have a Christian school, people want to send their kids to this Christian school to get them away from the junk of the world, right? Okay? And, and that... This is what happens, all right? And I've been involved in Christian schools before. Many people, they want their kids in Christian schools to get them away from the junk that's in the public school. We all get that, right? So what do we do when you sit, break, take your kid out of the public school and you put them into a Christian school and then the kids in the Christian schools are just like the kids in the public school? Well, that defeats a purpose, right? So you know what? We got to make sure that doesn't happen. So we've got to tell the kids in this Christian school, you're not allowed to go to movie theaters. You're not allowed to watch this movie. You're not allowed to do this. You have to dress this way. Well, here's the problem. Those rules that you're putting on them, God didn't ordain us to put those rules on. God ordained the parents to do that. Yeah, but we can't have a Christian school and not have any rules. See, there's the problem. God never ordained that the church educate the children either. Just like God never ordained the government to educate the children either. And people, because they saw how bad things were going with their kids in the public school, they said, we need to have Christian schools. Well, we had Christian schools, and they raised a sorry generation too. What's going on? God didn't ordain either of those things. God ordained parents to teach the kids. See what, see what I'm saying? When you, when you, and even though many of these pastors 
have a lot of wisdom. They're good people. They're trying to teach the right standards, but they're trying to do it with an authority that God never gave them. They're trying to do it with a ministry that God never called for. It's not going to work. It, and it has not worked. It has failed miserably. And so we've got, we've got to stay away from those things. When it comes to decisions that are being made, we need to follow the proper leadership and the proper authority. Who is actually the one in the position of authority? Okay, If we've got some girl that's not dressing right, who is the one that's supposed to be fixing that? It's her dad that's supposed to be fixing that. He's the one that has that authority. <clears throat> and so well-meaning pastors, they've taken on responsibilities they had no business taking on. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Do you all see that structure there? That Look at that again. The head of every man is Christ. Wait a minute. In this umbrella of authority, where is the pastor in here? Hey, we're talking about we're talking about a family here. The head of every woman is the husband. The head of every man is the Christ. Is Christ. So, where is the pastor? Where do I fit in that? You are in a totally different diagram, and you're over the church. Y'all get that? I have authority here in what we do here, but in home, guess what, husbands? Christ is the one over you in that situation. I, as a pastor, I do not have the right to go and start exercising authority in your home. And I might know better than you. There might be stuff that you allow in your house that I wouldn't. Well, who's right? Probably me. Okay? But God did not ordain me to go and enforce these things on you. He ordained you to do it. And like these pastors, they're so convinced they're right. And here's the thing. They are right but you're wrong and going and trying to put yourself somewhere where you don't belong and where you have no business. But these guys are so full of themselves. They've had so much praise thrown at them. You know, they feel like they're just the Messiah of every family. All right? Y'all just need to let me come in your home. I'll fix all your problems. You know, well, you know, we'll listen to your advice. We'll listen to your counsel. But at the end of the day, it's our decision. And many pastors that are out there today, you can never ask for their counsel in anything. Because if you do, and you don't follow it, they're going to preach against you for the next six months. You know, and it's like, you know, we can get, you know, and that's, I try to be this way. I, you know, I give counsel when it's asked, but at the end of the day, if, if you ask me for counsel on a decision that needs to be made in your home, at the end of the day, it's your decision. And I know pastors, they want their people to come to them and get approval for a, before they buy a house, before they buy cars. So you're, I am, and I am not exaggerating, folks. There are people out there that will they do they come to their past. They want them to go to the car dealer with them, help you know, to prove their choice of a vehicle. And then it goes to their head. They've got all these people that are willing to do that. And then you've got one person in the church that doesn't do it. He just goes and he takes responsibility himself. He buys a car. Pastor gets bent out of shape, and he does a whole financial series about wasting money. You know, just to preach at that one person and, you know, in that financial series, you know, it all goes to this. You need to learn to follow good counsel. A multitude of counselors are safety. You need to listen to the pastor. You need to listen to the pastor. You need to listen to the pastor. These, these guys, they just, the authority goes to their head. And you know what? Why don't you just teach Bible principles and shut up? Why don't you just set, set an example and shut up and stop trying to enforce things? And unfortunately, this kind of thing has gone on and so uh you know it when you when you do when you put yourself in this king position when you put yourself in this place of great authority it gives you a greater opportunity to abuse that authority so you we all see the way the catholics worship these priests go around kissing their ring stuff like that that kind of worship can go to a man's head and we've got baptist preachers that are trying to bring these things on themselves and they are, they're just, the, the amount of authority they have, because they, I mean, they can, they'll turn your world upside down. You know how many kids today, I mean, literally, they're in church seven days a week. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? 
Well, it's not necessarily what God ordained. God ordained the parents raise their kids, and they're in church seven days a week. They're in church on Sunday. They're in school Monday through Friday while mom and dad's working, and then they're in youth department all day on Saturday. They're like never at home. And then their whole life is wrapped up in the sports programs and things that they have in these schools and all these after-school activities and Saturday youth work and everything. And, you know, the kids all love it. It's a lot of fun, you know, and they're able to make these things work because you got people in the church donating all the money to these things. And so they're able to com compete with the public schools many times in, in certain cases. And, you know, now you got this kid all wrapped up in sports and everything. Well, you know what? If I'm the pastor and I don't like what they're doing, you know what? I can just threaten to pull their kids out of sports. And you say, that's not a big deal. You've never been to a Baptist church that has a sports program. It is the life of some of these people. It is the life. And I've seen it when the sports programs go in the churches. Guess what happened? Those families go too. And I have seen that over and over again. I have seen it where parents have had their kids in, in Christian schools. That they were involved in the sports, cram, sports program. They had a really good team. And then one year, a bunch of their good players graduate and these parents, they want their kids on a good team. And so they go, and they will move to a different church that has a school that has a more impressive sports program. And sometimes they do it, too, because they want that better sports program to help their kid you know, get that basketball scholarship or something like that. Why are we doing that in church? What in the world does that have to do with church? It has nothing to do with church, but yet these are things that if we had those things in the church... I now have a lot more power over people. But when you have a church that the focus is preaching the word of God and soul winning, what, you know, what am I going to do? Ban you from tithing? <laughs> you know, ban you from going soul winning? These churches that have that, they can't pay people to go soul winning. In fact, they have to pay people to go soul winning. The only ones that do it are the paid staff in that church. And the paid staff that's in that church is all being funded by people for who are paying for these ministries that are in the church that the Bible never called for. And so the amount of power these, these churches have is scary, and there is abuse of that power. Great abuse <clears throat> that takes place as a result of it. And so the, uh, these, these guys, you know, they thought, though, this is going to be good. We're going to pull them out of the world. I think their intentions were good. But God never called for these things, and it turned into a monster. A lot of the abuse that takes place, it happens with kids in the school. It happens with women in the church. You know, they, uh, many of these churches, they've hired a lot of female employees. And where do most affairs take place? In the workplace. But churches are the workplace for many people. And you've got all these pastors that are surrounded by all these women all the time, and they wonder why stuff happens. You know, they turn their, they've turned their churches into large corporations, you know, instead of being real soul-winning churches. They've got so many employees in the church that are now financially dependent on the church. The last thing they need is a doctrinal split in the church where they lose a lot of the money. Well, man, if we have a split in the church, then... The offerings are going to slow down. We're going to have to lay some people off. Well, we, if we lay these people off who are huge helps in the ministry, they're probably just going to leave and move and go somewhere else. And then we're going to be hurting even more. And there are, and, and in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you know, the, that, you know, the IFB movement boomed and they did. They built some large buildings, large corporations. And today they are doing everything they can to just survive. And that is why the preaching is so lame. That's why they're turning trendy. They are trying to, they are desperately trying to find some way to get people in, to get money in the offerings plate, offering plate, so they can pay the bills on these for the utilities on these palaces that they have. God never called for that. He never intended that. <clears throat> and so in, in the th the thing is, they these corporations they've set up, this is where a lot of the abuse has taken place. You know, the activity in the church, it's not about being filled with the Spirit. It's not about doing the work of the Lord. It is a worldly organization of many times worldly people that are not Spirit-filled, doing administrative things that God never called for in the church, and they, they're doing work just like any other corporation, and they have the same kind of junk that goes on in that church that other corporations do. That's why these things are happening. 
And so, you know, what's, and what's interesting too about most church splits today that are going on in these type of churches, it's not about doctrine. You know what it is? It's about the program at the church. It's the drama. You know, my kid, you know, he's not a starter anymore in the basketball team. We're moving and going to this other church. It's got another school where the players are crummier at this one, so my kid will be a starter. You know, it's, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. It is wrong. Uh, look at Romans, and go, uh, well, you don't have to, you know, you know Romans 8, 28. But many pastors, too, so they've set these things up that's just not biblical. Sin comes in, abuse takes place. I mean, there's been child molestation. There has been adultery. There's been fornication. I mean, I know stories of the leaders in the ministry, their wives uh, getting pregnant by you know, teenage students in the schools and things like that. I mean, just wicked, wicked stuff. And it gets covered up. It gets covered up because they were more concerned about how their movement looked than how Christ looked. And look at Romans 8.28. Right? Look at Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them who are called, uh, to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All right. Now I want to talk about that word called there for a minute. Because another thing that preachers have done, you know, in the preacher world, they like talking about the call to preach. Okay? And they've come up with this call to preach. You got to be called to preach. And you get called to preach, you know, that just puts your way up there. And I listen, I listened to my dad one time having a conversation with another evangelist. And they were discussing divorced preachers and divorced pastors. And the Bible's real clear about that. And my dad told this man, he's like, you know, the Bible's real clear on the husband of one wife. And this evangelist, he said, well, what if the wife just leaves him for no reason? And my dad said, you know, he, did, he hasn't ruled his own house well. You know, he's disqualified. The Bible's real clear on that. And you know what? This is what the man said. I'll never forget this. He's like, so you mean to tell me that some Jezebel, this is what he said, that some Jezebel can disqualify a God-called man. That's what he said. A God, and I was just a teenager, and I sat there, and I'd be quite, I'm not, as a teenager, I remember thinking, she didn't disqualify him. The Bible disqualifies him. The Bible's real clear on that. Because, and they do, they love talking about the call of God, all right? And this is what he said, too. Uh, this, is, this is the verse he said. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. This is what, that, that is what they say. When you, at, when you start talking about disqualified preachers, they'll say, if he was called to preach, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And that's from Romans chapter 11. But you all understand in Romans chapter 11, that was actually talking about a specific calling, all right? Now, let's talk about the call to preach, okay? Because what did God call for? Let's ask that question. It, in fact, here's what God called for. So this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. What did God call for? A bishop, then, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children subjected with all gravity. For a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the approach and snare of the devil. That's what God called for right there. How, who are in there? And they're like, who are you to say a God called man is disqualified? Who are you to call for something that God didn't call for? God called for them, a bishop, to be one who meets these qualifications. And we've got men today that are adulterers, that are fornicators, guys who did it in the ministry. All right, guys who, I mean, many of these things that happen, even guys like Peter Ruckman, he did it while he was in the ministry. He did these things. And people want to say, nope, we, we have no right to do it. He's been called of God. Really, how, how do you know that? Well, because he tells that story about how he was at that camp meeting and the Holy Spirit just came all over him and God told him, you know, I need you. I need you so bad. I've got to have you. 
You know, I'm going to kill you if you don't go to that altar and, you know, surrender to the call to preach. And he went, oh, okay, now how do we know that? How do we know that really happened? How do we know that God really called him? All right, how do we, we're just going off of his testimony. All right, so the way we know if they actually are called of God is do they fit the criteria that God called for? And do they desire so what, what what if they don't want what if they meet all the criteria but they don't want to be a pastor that's why it says for if a man desire the office of a bishop y'all see that so what god called for is in first timothy chapter three and there are men today many of the the abuses that you read in these stories were done by men who had disqualified themselves who were already disqualified, and yet they went and people want to go and sweep it under the rug and say they are called of God, we can't touch them, we can't do anything about it. No, they have not been called of God. In fact, God has called them out of the ministry. God may very well have called them into the ministry, but when they go and they get divorced, they fornicate or they commit adultery, then guess what? God has now called them out of the ministry. And you give to the calling of God without repentance. All right? Let's... There's different callings. There's different gifts. The office of a bishop, God did not call, God didn't make it a lifetime appointment. God put disqualifiers in there. And people want to go to Romans 11 that has nothing to do with a bishop. And they just want to use that one line, just like, you know, Baptists want to do. They just want to take verses out of context and just run with it. And it's wrong. It is dead wrong. And so. Uh, that is why we have a lot of these things. God's blessing is not going to be in that man. The Holy Spirit's not going to use that man. God did not call for him. And so they do. The, many of these people, they, uh, this, and this is just a mistake of the previous generation. That previous generation, they made such a big deal about ministry, they put ministry over their family. Not realizing that their family is their ministry. That if they lose their family, they have disqualified themselves from the ministry. You know, they've done the classic thing we were talking about before. Oh, you know, that Satan, there's a great big target on their back because they're such a great man of God. It's not their fault. You know, they were just being so greatly used of God, Satan worked over time to get their kids and to destroy their marriage. Well, maybe Satan worked over time, but you know what? Satan won. The man's disqualified. God might have called the ministry, but they have been called out when... When they believe, uh, when they when they failed, when they did those things, and we should not put, I, I should not put my ministry over my family. My family is my ministry. If I fail with them, I failed in my ministry. And thankfully, I believe this generation has figured that out. I think there's kind of been a revival in that in the in the old IFB world. I think they're doing a better job in many cases. My dad, thankfully, he saw a lot of that stuff and he learned from that. And, you know, he didn't get caught up in being a big shot and going around preaching all the preaching conferences and things. You know, he, you know, he was at home. You know, he took care of his family. He took care of his church. Many of these preachers, too, who turned out the most sorry kids were the preachers that were just never home. They were too busy going around the country being big shots. And once again, I think they were going around the country not so much to be big shots, but because they were convinced they were going to help the world, that the world needed them. But, you know, they forgot that their family needed them at home too. And you know what? God didn't call for them to necessarily fix all the churches in the world, but God did call them to take care of that family that he gave them. And they neglected that ministry to focus on another ministry, and they messed it up. And thankfully, I've heard many old IFB preachers from that generation who have admitted, hey, we did this wrong and I think there's been an attempt to fix that, and I think it's got I think it's gotten better. And I'm thankful. I think I think my dad was a part of that generation that figured it out because it benefited me greatly. And I, I'm I'm very thankful for that. And so, you know, and, and we, we don't have time to you know to go into many more of these things. But ultimately, what I think, in a nutshell, what I the reason I think there's been so much abuse, or and, and there's and really there's not been a ton when you consider how many IFB churches there are, when you consider how many years these stories are spread over. I understand there's a lot of things people don't know about. There's a lot of guys that never got caught. I understand that, but when you look at a lot of these situations, when you look at a lot of these things that have taken place, it has taken place in places where the guy who did it just got 
lived way high in power. You know, men like Brother Hiles, I mean, the man was esteemed a little too highly, I'm afraid. And while I don't personally believe he ever did anything, you know, immoral, we see that the next guy who came along, who automatically received that same praise because he took the throne, we see that it went to his head. And we all know what happened to that guy. And there are, there are many good preachers out there who they haven't let the praise go to their head. They have taken, they have taken the worship. They have taken it, but yet in their own hearts and in their own minds, they have remained humble servants of God. And they have used that power that they had for good, but it was power they weren't supposed to have. And unfortunately, what ends up happening many times, the next generation that comes along that just gets, you know, the scepter passed to them. We're going to pass this on to you, you know, and they get coronated or whatever. All of a sudden, they receive this power. They, they go nuts with it. And they end up abusing it. And um, I'm afraid a flawed system is what has created a lot of these. We, should, we shouldn't have been so into people's lives to the point we're making rules for people's homes where we have the kids in the church seven days a week. Okay? That is not going to build strong families. Uh, that, that's, that's not going to work. That's not what God called for. And when, when these things come up, all right, you know, it, you know, if anything ever happens here, we need to make sure we deal with it in a biblical matter. We, ought, we need to listen to the church. Go ahead and turn back to 1 Timothy well, we already looked at 1 Timothy 5, 19-22, but, you know, the God, you know, against an elder, see not an accusation before two or three witnesses. There is a way that needs to be dealt with. I am not immune from scrutiny. And, I, and we have, we've, we've put checks and balances in place here that I think we've needed to, and I think they have helped us greatly. I am thankful for those things. And, you know, and in light of things that have happened, you know, you know, just recently and things that are going on in churches today, you know what? I think we need to put some more checks and balances in place. And, you know, one of the things, one of the things that I want to do, in fact, when we have a meeting, one of the things, we need to start replacing some of these doors. I want my office door to have a window on it. I, I, we, you know, we have too many rooms around here that have doors with no windows. So what's the big deal? We want to make sure things are just open, you know, it doesn't even look like anything could happen. We want to avoid any appearance of evil. I just got somebody mad at me the other day because they wanted one of the ladies wanted to come here and do something, and I told their husband, I said, I'm going to be here during that time, you know. So, and you know, and he was understanding about it, but then he told his wife, and she freaked out. All right, now don't worry about it; they're not a problem anymore. But at the same time. He said, well, you know, what do you, do you think she, uh, or you would, no, I don't think they would do anything. I, I know I wouldn't do anything. But at the same time, we follow these rules to protect ourselves. Okay? If I'm here by myself, we don't need another lady coming here at the church by herself. Okay? That's, that's bad testimony. There was a time I was here at the church by myself, and I remember I heard somebody knock on the door, and there were these two, you know, young girls they're like riding their bikes, camera like, we got to go to the bathroom so bad. Can we please use your bathroom? Can we use your bathroom? And I was not even thinking. I said yes. And as soon as I said that, I was like, I probably shouldn't have done that. And so I went and I stood outside and I waited for them to get done and leave. I stayed, I stood outside the whole time and they left. And afterwards, I probably, I probably just should have told them no. But once I, you know, it happened fast. And once I did it, I was like, I want to stand outside. I, I never would, I never would do anything. But you know what? The last thing we need is an accusation here because unfortunately there are people that will do it and there are people that have done it. And unfortunately, there are people out there that have ruined the good name of Baptist. And we need to make sure that we set some things up to make sure these things can never happen. And like I said in that email, if we're not careful, if we get too big for our britches, if we get lifted up with pride, this kind of thing's going to happen. If you let praise go to head, I'm telling, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to be humble. I hate it when people just when I get excessive praise. I mark people that do that. There is somebody on YouTube. I don't even know who they are. I think it's a fake account 
They get on there. They're always praising me and saying all these. I, and you, you tell my wife, I have marked them. I am convinced that they are a bad guy and infiltrator. I mean, I, I get creeped out by that stuff. Don't do it, all right? If, even if it's sincere, I don't need it going to my head. But at the same time, the Bible's real clear about those who are, you know, are flatterers. And they're, they're dangerous. And you know what? Every pastor, they want to be a great man of God. They want to have great wisdom. They want to help people. And they believe they can. They believe what they te believe, you know, are teaching and what they do will change the lives of people. They believe that with all, they believe that with all their heart. And unfortunately, many times there's people that come along and they tell them everything that they think about themselves and they're trying to be. And it goes to their head. They're like, yeah, I did it. Of course I, you know. And, and you know, I, I try not to be that way, you know. And we, and we, shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be that way. We need to remain humble, and I, I believe, and, and I, I said I didn't cover everything, but I think a lot of what has caused this abuse in the IFB is it's just a bad structure, a bad system that God did not call for, and it's just created a great environment for abuse, and we're going to keep that out of here. So with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. I pray you'll help us, Lord, to protect our church. I pray we'll have a good testimony that we will uh, take into consideration the things we do and how they look, and we'll remember, Lord, just our position and who we are, and that we will be humble uh, servants of you that uh, follow your word, Lord, to the letter. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's go.